In this Godot tutorial, I'll teach you how to create this stack splitting functionality for your inventory system. This is a continuation on the previous tutorial on stackable items. So if you haven't watched that one yet, make sure you click that link up there and watch that video first. With a stack splitting functionality, there is a number of exploits that might creep into the code. I've addressed them all in this tutorial, but to make sure you follow along as we program that code in, I first want to show you what we have to address so you're better able to understand why we're doing the things that we will be doing in the next 20 minutes or so. So I've got the normal drag and drop functionality right here from the previous tutorials. And I've programmed that when I hit my shift key, then the stack splitting functionality opens up. And I can, for example, say split this into a stack of two and four. Now, so far, so good. And I can split this again. However, if we want to split a stack of one, there's nothing to split. And this, if you don't address for it, could be a potential way that players can intentionally or unintentionally duplicate items. So when I hold my shift key while dragging a stack of one, we just want that to revert to a normal drag and drop move. And there's no pop-up for splitting that stack at all. So that's the first thing we have to address. Now, the second thing that might go wrong is that if we are splitting a stack to, for example, a sword, the sword doesn't have anywhere to go. So you can do two things. You can either program that the sword automatically finds an empty inventory slot to move to, or you can just not allow a splitting stack when we drag to a already filled up inventory slot. You can only uh, drag this potion while holding shift while splitting to an empty slot, and only then will you be able to work with that. Then lastly, another exploit or another thing that we have to take into account, we got seven chocolate cakes here. But what if I split and I say, well, I want 10, I want a stack of 10. In that case, the code has to recognize that that is too much. It needs to uh, leave a stack of one chocolate cake behind and then move the maximum amount. In that case, it will be six chocolate cakes. So we got all of that program, then we'll all be doing this in the next 20 or so minutes. I just want to make sure that you see what could be the potential problems or the potential player input that we have to make sure that the code addresses and then does something that is not weird to the player and might even be functional to the player. So without further ado, let's get started. First, we need to create that little piece of user interface that pops up whenever we try and split a stack. For that, we're going to create a new scene, a new user interface scene, and we change the type of the default control node to a pop-up. That will help us with the render order, make sure that it's always going to be in front of every single other element in our user interface. I'll rename it to our item split pop-up so that we know what it actually is. Now, this is, of course, way too big, so we're going to change the size of it to 250 by 60. We'll reset that size right here, and we have to change the anchors, which are currently to the view, full viewport, to the top left so that we can position it at the right location. With that done, all we have to do is save this. I'm going to save this in my scenes UI templates, and I'll save it as item split pop up. Now I can add a nine patch rectangle to add the background to our panel. We're going to set the layout of the nine patch rectangle to full rectangle. And I'm going to be using this square inventory frame as my background. Now the texture being square and the panel being rectangular, the borders are going to look really weird. And with the patch margin 25 left and right, 15 top and bottom, we can make sure that that border looks nice and clean. Now I'll rename this to just N to keep our node paths nice and short in the code. Next, we'll add a margin container, which we'll abbreviate to just M. We'll set the layout of the margin container also to full rectangle, and we're going to give it five margin on all sides to make sure that every element we add does not interfere with our border art. With the margin container added, we can add the HBox container, which immediately takes the right size to add our elements. And of course, we have to be adding a line edit and a texture button to make this panel functional. Let's start with the line edit. We'll add a new child node to the HBox container, and that will be of line edit. Let's first change the font so that at least it's gonna uh, look good. So I'll load a resource from one of the previous tutorials in this series, and I'll load Arial 24 for this one. Now let's add a little bit of dummy text, and it's probably gonna be better if we align this to the center. Now, of course, we could also change the font color if we would want to maybe make it uh, less harsh uh, with a little bit of broken white. 
With that done, we have our line edit. We're just gonna rename this to amount so that we know what we're doing in the code. For the texture button, we of course are also gonna add that child to the HBox container that we be of type texture button. We'll rename this to confirm. We'll set expand on in the inspector so that we can add some textures without actually changing the size of the node. And I'm gonna be using two textures. The first one is the mid button on in the uh, asset pack that I've been using for about six episodes now. It's linked down below, it's from the Unity Asset Store. Um, but as I said before in a previous tutorial, this artist is not really that good with the naming convention. So the actual pressed version of this button is called inventory button for some reason. I would strongly suggest you change the naming convention so that you can find your assets more easily. I'm keeping the same name so that you know exactly which ones I've used and you can just do a control search in the download folder if you choose to use this, uh, this asset pack. With that done, we're gonna go down to the size flags of the texture button and we're gonna tell it to horizontally expand as much as possible, thereby it will take the remaining space in the HBox container and that is perfectly sized to what we want. Now, of course, we want this to have a label so that the player will know what he's actually gonna be pressing. Then with the label layout, set it to full rectangle. We're just gonna say, okay, that's good enough. We align it both horizontally and vertically and of course, we have to change the font. We are gonna load from resource the same font, Arial 24, that way the size of both the text, the number, and the button are going to be the same, which will make it look better. Now, of course, similarly to how we change the font color of the line edit, we'll also change it to broken white on the, uh, the actual label of the button, that way it looks the part. Now, the only thing we have to change is we this dummy text that we have added here for testing purposes, 999, gonna delete that so it opens up with a empty line added as we gonna insert it into our inventory window. But before we can do that, we first need to have the code recognized when we're pressing our shift key to actually split a stack. To do that, I'm gonna go to my project project settings to my input map and we'll define a new action. I'm gonna call this action secondary because it's gonna be the secondary function under my drag and drop. And with this more general name, I might also put other functionalities in other UI panels underneath here. I'm gonna add that as an action and I'll add a key with this little plus here that will be a key. I'll hit shift and I'll press okay. Now we have our shift key programmed and we can do something with that in our code. We're gonna start coding in the inventory slot code that we've been working on over the last couple of episodes. In the get drag data, we don't have to change anything. We already know whether the item is stackable and we already know its current stack size. In the can drop data, however, we do have to change something. This is where we have to verify if the inventory slot we're dragging to while splitting a stack is already occupied. As I explained at the beginning, we want that situation to not be possible. We know whether the inventory slot is filled by the first if statement. It checks if the inventory data item is null. In other words, we're moving an item and otherwise we're swapping. In case we would be in a swapping situation, we don't want the splitting of stacks to be possible. To do that, we're gonna nest a else if statement in between these two lines, in between line 39 and 40. To do that, I'll just copy paste over the code that I've prepared. Here we got this new if else statement in between. So this code remains exactly the same. And all we do is we check in case we're trying to swap an item, if action is pressed secondary, the shift key is currently being pressed. In that case, we return false and otherwise we just handle it as normal. Lastly, for our drop data function, we're also going to be adding code to the top before the rest runs. But before we do that, I regretfully left a bug in the previous stacking items tutorial. So let's quickly show you what that bug is and then we're immediately gonna fix it in this new piece of code. The stacking of items works perfectly fine. However, if I were to drag an item and then drag it on top of itself, it's gonna show, well, a label of two and the item is gone. And if I were to try and get six potions again, we'll see that we actually lost a potion there. And that's definitely not intended. So we are going to be addressing both splitting stacks and that little bug at the same time. We're gonna start by taking this whole block of code We'll indent it one to the right so that we have a little bit of extra space for a new if else if else function. The first two lines of code are gonna be addressing that bug. So it's gonna check whether the um, node of the item that we're dragging is the same as self. And otherwise we have dropped it on top of itself, in which case it will pass, all the other code won't run and basically nothing happens. 
For our stack splitting functionality, we're going to check if input is action press secondary. We're trying to split a stack. Then we check if whatever we are trying to split originates from the inventory panel. Because if we're trying to drag an item from our equipment panel to the inventory while holding shift, maybe the player is trying that out, we don't want any special functionalities to trigger as there's only non-stackable items in our equipment panel. Then lastly, we check if the origin stack size is bigger than one. This addresses one of those possible exploits that I've shown you at the beginning of this tutorial. This is where the player intentionally or unintentionally may try and split a stack of one and thereby maybe duplicating the item. So once we've got that and we're actually going to split an item, we're going to pull a new instance of the split pop-up. The split pop-up is defined on the top here on line number four, which preloads the scene we've created at the beginning of the tutorial. With that split pop-up instance, we're going to set the rectangle position, so the position where it needs to render into the screen with the get global transform with canvas. The same function we also use to position the tooltip at the right location. We're going to take the origin of the inventory slot and we're going to offset it with a vector 2, 0, 100, meaning that we are going to render the split pop-up underneath the inventory slot from where we're actually trying to split an item or split a stack. Then we're going to take the data variable that was input in this function, and that is the data dictionary that has all this information, information that we need for our split functionality. And we're going to push that to the split pop-up. That means that we'll be putting some code on the split pop-up itself, and that is going to be requiring that data. Then we add the child to the scene tree, and we're going to be showing the pop-up. Since it's a pop-up, a pop-up always goes by default uh, hidden into the scene tree, so you specifically have to call out the show function. Going back to our item split pop-up, let's first add the code here before we continue with that inventory slot. We're going to add a new script to the main node. We'll create that script and before we add any code, let's first connect up our confirm button. With that button selected, we go over to node, we go to our press signal, we connect it to the script we have just added under the main node. I'll select everything and override it with the code we need, but do connect that signal up, otherwise this won't work. First off, we need a variable data because as you saw 20 seconds ago, we're pushing the entire data dictionary of the inventory slot to this pop-up panel. And of course, we need to store that on that data variable that we called. Then under ready, we're going to get the node amount. So that will be the line edit. And we're going to grab focus. That makes sure that the cursor is immediately ready on that line edit so that the player doesn't need to use his mouse first to select the line edit. It can just go straight on and type. Then on confirm press, when we press OK, we're going to be retrieving that split amount as get with the get text function from the amount, the line edit. Then if the split amount is nothing, and if, if the player didn't fill out anything, we're just going to set the split amount to one because we are splitting something. So then we're going to take the minimum stack size, which is of course one. If, however, the split amount, which we first have to turn into an integer, if that is bigger than or equal to the original stack size, then we set the split amount to its maximum, and that is the original stack size minus one. This is the two lines of code that are going to be addressing that last exploit that I demonstrated out of the three. And that is when you have, for example, seven chocolate uh, cakes and you uh, split them and you fill in 10 in the split amount. Then we don't, of course, want that to be 10 or nine chocolate cakes. We want that to revert to the maximum split size, which in this case would be six. So that is what these two lines of code do that is addressing that last piece of exploit. Then we're going to get the parent and the parent in this case is the inventory slot that called in this pop up. And we're going to run the function, which we have not coded yet. So that's what we'll be doing after this, the split stack uh, function, and we'll push the split amount and we'll push back the data that it originally sent to us. Then we're going to quick free this pop up. We don't need it anymore. And then lastly, we have this function input event. Function input event is just listening for input. And here we have the event is action pressed UI accept. That is not something I've created. The UI accept, um, if I scroll up a little bit, is a standard function, which is standard programmed with the enter function. If the player presses the enter key, we are going to run the unconfirmed press. We do that because as we have grabbed focus, the player is immediately probably with his mouse, uh, mouse with his hand on the numpad 
typing in the amount he wants. And of course, normally you just immediately hit enter. But if you hit enter, that is not what the signal is doing with the confirm button. So we are going to take that enter input and we're going to emulate as if the confirm button was pressed by calling the function in itself. Thereby, we don't require the player to use the mouse at all on the uh, split item pop-up, and it can just you know, have a little bit of quality of life when it comes to the user friendliness of this panel. With that done, we can now go back to the inventory slot and we can code this function split stack. Back on our inventory slot script, the script where we have just added the code to instance in that split stacking pop-up. I'm going to scroll down here and I'm going to be adding a new function. That will be split stack, which receives the split amount and that data dictionary from the item split pop-up. We're first going to be defining the target inventory slot and the original slot. These are two easy references for our inventory data. And these are the two same lines of code we are using on the drop data. So with those two references for easy use, we can first start by changing the data of our inventory. We of course have to change the stack size of our original slot. We take the original stack size and we deduct the split amount. Then we can create the new item in our inventory, which of course a duplication of the item we're splitting just with a different stack size. So we take the new target inventory slot and we define the item as the data original item ID. The stack size is of course going to be the split amount that we have deducted from the original stack. Then the texture of this target inventory slot can be the same as the original texture as we're splitting an item. Then what we have to do is we have to change the labels. Now for the labels we need to change both the label of the original node and we need to change the label of the target node where we have created the stack to. Of course we only want to display these labels if the stack size is bigger than 1. That's a choice I've made, an aesthetic choice that's not absolutely required, but that's how we have done it in the previous tutorial for stackable items, and I'll continue that here. So first we have to check if the stack size, which remains on the original node, the original inventory slot, if that is still bigger than one, because that could have changed. We could have, and of course, uh, reduced that to one. So we take, take the original stack size, again minus the split amount, and if that is still bigger than 1, then we're going to get that stack label and we're going to set it to the original stack minus split amount. Otherwise, if it is now 1, we are simply going to set that text to nothing. For the target node that we are working with, we're going to get, if it's bigger than 1, the stack size, set that to the split amount, and otherwise we set it to nothing. And with all these changes done, we can now play the game I'll make it a little bit bigger. We can still add all these items together. I'll add an item to itself where you can see we have addressed that bug that I've shown you. But also if I hit the shift key and I would to drag this potion out, we get our pop-up. We immediately grab that focus. We can, for example, hit two. I can hit OK, but also what I can do is can hit one and I can hit enter. And that immediately does that as well. That's that little quality of life uh, addition that we have added to the uh, code of that item split pop up uh, instance. And just like that, we can also, for example, say we want a stack size of 10 or even we want a stack size of 99 and nothing weird is happening. If we're trying to split a stack of one, you can see that it just reverts back to a normal drag and drop. If we were to hit the shift key and were to drag an equipment item, you can see that also reverts back to a normal drag and drop. And if we were to do the same from the inventory to the equipment panel, because the equipment panel doesn't have any code that looks for that shift button, because the equipment slot has a different code, it simply does not recognize that shift key at all because it's not even listening for it. And that just is just a normal drag and drop as we would normally expect. And with that, I think we have a fully functioning inventory split functionality that you can use in your game. That was it for today, guys. Hope you liked this video. If you did, smash that like button, hit subscribe. Don't forget that little bell icon to make sure that you don't miss out on that next video. In the next video, I think I'll be coding a little bit of a different element, but on top of this, uh, this equipment and inventory system. Let's take a 2D character and let's change the appearance of the 2D character based on the equipment that you're equipping to that character. Uh, it's a, a tutorial that quite a number of you have actually requested and I'm happy to oblige. So that's up next week. I hope to see you then. And until then, keep on gaming, keep on coding. See you later, guys.